This video was brought to you by Brilliant. Since Imran Khan was ousted from power in April of last year, Pakistan has been in a state of permanent political crisis. That's because since then, Khan has toured the country demanding fresh elections, which he would probably win, and accused the new government of being puppets of the CIA and the Pakistani army. For their part, the government has accused Khan of breaking various laws while he was in office, which could result in him being banned from standing for office in the future, as well as them trying to arrest Khan on multiple occasions in the last year or so. The latest attempt was just earlier this month, prompting massive protests across the country. So in this video, we're going to take a look at Khan's recent arrests, the protests and the brewing showdown between Khan and the Pakistani army. Now, this might not sound obvious, but a good place to start this story is Pakistan's economy and its long-standing issues. Now, this is a bit of an oversimplification, but essentially, successive Pakistani governments have borrowed and spent more money than they could afford, often to subsidize inefficient state-owned businesses and to cover Pakistan's massive military budget, which accounts for about 20% of Pakistan's total government expenditure. For context, Pakistan's military expenditure, expressed as a percentage of GDP, is roughly twice the global average of 2%. This military overspend is at least in part because the Pakistani army still wields significant political power in the country, even though the country is nominally a democracy. And as such, incumbent governments need to keep the army happy if they want to stay in power. Now, perhaps unsurprisingly then, since its independence, Pakistan has fluctuated between civilian and military governments, with the army staging coups whenever it disagreed with the government of the time. With the last coup happening in 1999, and the military only giving up power in 2007. Astonishingly, none of the country's 23 prime ministers has ever completed a full five-year tenure. And in fact, Pakistan's first peaceful transfer of power from one democratically elected government to another only happened in 2013. Anyway, all of this fiscal imprudence has meant that every couple of years, Pakistan has needed another bailout, usually from the IMF. In fact, since 1988, Pakistan has received an astonishing 13 IMF loans, with the latest coming in 2019. Now, these regular bailouts and the IMF are deeply unpopular with the Pakistani public, because they're usually conditional on painful austerity measures. So, when Imran Khan ran for Prime Minister in 2018, he promised to end Pakistan's economic crisis by stamping out corruption, taxing Pakistan's elite, and refusing any further IMF loans. It seemed that this message resonated with the Pakistani public, because his party, known as PTI, won with 43% of the seats in that election. Now, obviously, this wasn't quite enough for an outright majority, so Khan formed a coalition with a bunch of other minor parties. However, almost immediately after coming into office, Pakistan entered another debt crisis. To be fair, this one wasn't really Khan's fault, because thanks to excessive borrowing from previous administrations, Pakistan's debt servicing costs had started to eat into the country's foreign exchange reserves. But ultimately, Khan mishandled this crisis by flip-flopping with the IMF, which delayed the bailout and only exacerbated the crisis. This crisis only got worse after the pandemic too, when food and fuel prices started rising across the globe. Now, this is clearly a very global issue, but Pakistan was particularly badly affected given the country's dependence on imports and weak currency. All of these things combined then, a stagnant economy, high inflation, and the return of the IMF pushed Khan's approval ratings right down. And in March of last year, Khan's coalition partners deserted him, forcing a vote of no confidence, which Khan looks set to lose. In a last-ditch attempt to save his government, Khan convinced the deputy speaker to declare the vote as unconstitutional and challenged the opposition to a fresh round of elections. Now, the opposition didn't bite and instead took the case to Pakistan's Supreme Court, which declared Khan's action as unconstitutional and kicked him out of office. Khan was then promptly replaced by Shabazz Sharif, the brother of Mr. Khan's predecessor, Nawaz Sharif, and the leader of the opposition. 
Unfortunately for Sharif, though, his government hasn't been all that much more effective than Khan's in dealing with Pakistan's economic crisis. High global energy prices and Pakistan's terrible floods last year mean that inflation is still stubbornly high, and state finances are still under real pressure across the board. At the same time, Khan has been touring the country demanding new elections and accusing the government of being foreign shills. Perhaps as a result, polls suggest that Pakistanis agree with Khan's call for a new election, and these same polls suggest that he would win that election by a landslide. Now, that's probably why earlier this year, the government defied the Supreme Court and postponed local elections in Punjab, due for April 30th until October. And in the meantime, the government has accused Khan of breaking a whole load of laws while in office, mostly to do with corruption. In fact, the authorities have tried to arrest Khan on multiple occasions, but have struggled to do so because Khan has refused to leave his house, claiming that he's at risk of assassination. And beyond that, Khan supporters have kicked up a massive fuss every time an arrest has even been attempted. The latest attempt came on May 9th, when Khan was arrested inside the High Court in Islamabad by the National Accountability Bureau a Pakistani security service headed by a retired general. Unsurprisingly, Khan reacted furiously, accusing the army and the general of carrying out an illegal abduction. And this is only the latest in this escalation, because Khan has become increasingly explicit in his criticism of the army. Just a couple of days before his arrest, he accused a different general of being involved in the assassination attempt on his life in November of last year, and claimed, plausibly, that the military played a role in his ousting. Anyway, as usual, Khan's arrest sparked massive protests. However, in an unprecedented term, this time the protesters actually attacked the military directly. In the days after his arrest, PTI supporters attacked military installations. At least eight people were killed during these protests, and thousands have since been arrested, including some senior PTI officials. The army then announced that the protesters would be tried in military courts under the Army Act of the Official Secrets Act, and that the army would be deployed in major cities to prevent more protests. Now, this was controversial because military courts have a lower standard of evidence and process than civilian court, and as such, this was widely perceived as an escalatory intimidation tactic by the Pakistani army. Clearly then, there's a showdown brewing between Imran Khan and the Pakistani military, now, in the past, the military has always come out on top against Pakistan's politicians, but Khan's unique popularity among younger Pakistanis means that the outcome is perhaps not as predetermined as history would suggest. In fact, the army is also caught in a bit of a catch-22. Every time they try and arrest or shut Khan up, they play into his narrative that he's a martyr standing up for the people against an incompetent, corrupt establishment. Ultimately, while this political chaos might exacerbate Pakistan's economic crisis in the near term, Khan is probably right that the army still has too much influence in Pakistan's politics, and this will need to change if Pakistan wants to achieve economic and political stability. This isn't to condone Khan either, whose crusade is at least partly motivated by political self-interest. But it shouldn't be controversial to say that in the 21st century, Pakistan's government doesn't need to be nannied by its military. Ultimately then, this is yet another example of how our world is getting much more complicated, both politically and often, more importantly, economically. So it would be great if politicians were better at, well, maths and decision making. Fortunately, they could do that easily if they signed up to Brilliant, the STEM learning platform where you can learn everything from quantum computing or algebra to logical decision-making, a skill severely lacking at the moment. It doesn't take long to learn either. These complex topics are broken down into accessible chunks designed around your busy schedule. That means that by spending just a few minutes each and every day, you can accumulate new knowledge over time in an actually fun way. And as time goes on, you'll get used to that empowering feeling of learning. Because this isn't just about memorization and lectures. Brilliant teaches you by doing, using active learning techniques to teach you the principles behind otherwise complex subjects, and ensuring that you actually understand what's going on.
So whether you want to brush up on your basic math skills, improve your employment prospects by learning about future technologies, or just have fun with coding, you can check out everything that Brilliant has to offer for free for a full 30 days just by clicking the link in the description. Plus, the first 200 of you will get 20% off Brilliant's annual premium subscription.